Greetings, everyone, and welcome to R. Kelly Appeal TV. I'm so delighted to those who regularly tune into the channel. We have made 10,000 hours of R. Kelly Appeal TV watch time here on the channel, and I really find that to be a milestone. May all the people who watch the videos and listen to the podcast, may they really open their minds to see what is going on and why this appeal is so unique. And um, may the minds of the individuals or the powers that be really and truly listen and try to be as honest and open and fair in this appeal process as they can be. So I'll be doing something special for the R. Kelly Appeal TV channel while we wait for the sentencing hearing to lift the minds and spirits of those who want to know what's really going on in this appeal process. It's a very slow, mundane process. However, this too shall pass. So place in the comment box some ideas of what a raffle should look like for our Kelly Appeal TV that um, a special individual on the channel could win here at R. Kelly Appeal TV. So that's my gift. And um, now I want to talk about something special today. I want to present something that, you know, you might have heard, you may not have. For those who haven't heard this video, um, six years ago, in 2016, R. Kelly did an interview with GQ Magazine. It was a simple 45-minute song that he wanted to share with his fans. So today, I'm going to share that with you and ask you a few questions, being his supporters. So thank you so much again for helping the channel, and let's move right into the uncensored story of R. Kelly. Are we rolling? Are we rolling? Are we rolling? This is my life. I'm R. Kelly and this is my life. This is my life. This is my life. I'm R. Kelly and this is my life. Grew up on the south side of Chicago, born in 1967. And um, my eyes have seen a lot of things coming up in the hood. Jeffrey Manners, Argyle Gardens, 63rd and Michigan, all oh, the south side was no punk. Man, I tell you, I've seen a lot of junk, you know, coming up, you know, um, been through a lot. Of, my mom, my family, though we had not much of anything, we had family, we had us, we had love. And I, I believe, um, no, I know that that's what got us through, you know, um, that's what landed me here. Uh, I fell from the sky. Landed on the ground. All I know is, man, you know, <clears throat> I was like a sea. I was like a fish in the middle of an ocean. You know, I really like the metaphors that he uses here. Being like a fish in the middle of the ocean is showing how comfortable he was with his life prior to coming here because a fish is comfortable in the middle of the ocean. That's where he lives. Now, when he falls from the sky reminds me of the Antoine Fisher story. And if you have never her, uh, saw the Antoine Fisher story, please go and watch the Antoine Fisher story because it's very similar to some of the things that R. Kelly is talking about here. 
when he says that he came from under a rock. So what does these metaphors mean to you? Did R. Kelly feel comfortable falling from the sky into a world of people that he would eventually meet along the way? Did he already know what was going to take place in his life um, as being who he was? Because he knew he was someone great. He knew it. What's your thought? Then I woke up as a well in the middle of a pond. He became a giant in a small area of life. And when he wanted to go back to his normal life, others found him bigger than the life he remembered. That would be very uncomfortable to be this big fish with little or no water to breathe in when that's your comfort zone. How does that make you feel when you hear him say that? It made me think. It made me say, wow. You know, and I'll share some other thoughts later, but I really want to get your views in the comment box below. Let's go. That's how it went down for me, man. I blinked my eyes and next thing you know, I was in the midst of success, in the midst of drama, in the midst of rumors. In the midst of love, but in the midst of haters. But somehow, my gift, which was my music, uh, my depth of struggle was fed into my gift, and somehow my gift um, ignited uh, to the point where I was able to communicate with the world and ask the world, to rescue me. And the minute I opened my mouth and started to sing, oh, that changed everything. And out of nowhere, nowhere, I mean, I walked through the drug dealers, walked through the pimps and the hoes and the hustlers, through the hood. The drugs was offered to me. I've been shot, I've been stabbed. But I still, to this day, made it free. Out of the slums, out of the alleys, out of the, the deep, 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 dark hood. Sometimes I don't know. Sometimes I don't know just how I got here, just how I made it, just how I made it, just how I made it here. But I'm glad I did, I'm glad I did. All I ever wanted to do was music, you know, ever since I was eight years old, I can remember um, having a dream about being 20 something. And in that dream, I remember playing the piano, a white piano, hearing a melody. And the melody at eight years old in my dream where I was 20 went da 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 and here, 20 years later, 25 years later, I grow up, I become famous, and I'm sitting at a house where I bought my first piano, which was a white piano. And I began to play a song. I began to start writing on a song. And that same melody, when I was eight, came to me. And I couldn't figure out where I heard this melody from. At first, I thought I was, like, still in this melody, but come to realize that as the lyrics came to me, I believe I can fly. I believe I can touch the sky. I think about it every night and day. Spread my wings and fly away. He sacrificed so much for his fans, 
His life moved so fast. He came here and he was just here. He never had a childhood, really. His childhood was stolen. His innocence, his virginity stolen. Success came slow and hard for R. Kelly. And he's telling us this in this in his story. Tear comes down my eye because I say, wow, I wrote this song when I was eight. But coming up in the hood, I saw so many things. Though so many things brought me all of my dreams. And now here I am, here I am today. Here I am, here I am today. I want to say I'm proud of my past. Um, but more than I am proud, I'm more thankful. Because people ask me all the time, if you can go back in the past, what would you change? I say, I wouldn't change a thing. They say, what? All you've been through, you wouldn't change nothing? I say, no. They say, why? I say, why should I? Look at me. I'm strong. I'm wise. I'm appreciative. I don't take nothing for granted. My past shaped and molded me into who I am today. I think struggle is the best thing if you know how to deal with it, if you know how to overcome, if you know how to deal with your problems. Because if you know how to deal with your problems, and depending on how you deal with your problems, that will become the measure. That will become the measure. The measure of your worth. But you have to know how to deal with it. Anything that happened to me in my past, anything I've been through in my past, I look back behind me and I say, this is where God brought me from. The best gift in life is breathing in and out. So I'm very thankful if I had nothing, if I never sold one record. I was always taught how to be thankful for the gift of breathing in and out. Because as long as you can breathe in and out, you can make it. Ooh, you can make it. You can make it. You can make you, you, you can make it. Uh, you can make it as long as you breathe it. Long as you're alive, you can make it up. You know, I always used to sing in the shower because I was too shy to sing anywhere else. So I was singing in the shower. I thought I sounded good, but, you know, um, my sister would always bam on the door, tell me to stop calling hogs, get out of the bathroom because she had to get in there. I looked at that like she was jealous and, you know, just wanted to get in the bathroom, wanted me to get out so she could be in there 20 times as long as I'm, as I was in there, so. So he fell from the sky and met Teresa, his sister, the jealous sister, one who had always surrounded his life for a reason. See, R. Kelly knew at a young age that he was going to have some obstacles and struggles that would try to take his gift like all the Walt Disney characters, except R. Kelly's story was real. So you have Aladdin who was robbed of his growth, Sleeping Beauty, robbed of her life, Little Mermaid, robbed of her royalty, Swan Princess, robbed of her gift that she came to the planet to perform. It's always been there, right before our eyes. I thought it sounded pretty good. The shower 
gave me an echo, a reverb, a reverb that allowed me to hear myself so beautifully, so clearly, that it gave me the confidence to walk out of the shower eventually and sing throughout the house. Of course, the house did not have the same reverb. Outside did not have the same reverb. But when I dropped out of high school and became a street performer, I was trying to find that reverb that could echo my voice, that could echo my life so the world could hear the gift that I had in me. And people ask me to this day, what do you think about your success? How does it feel to perform in front of 100,000 people holding up candles where it looks like a sea of fire? I say, all of that's good and all, and I appreciate that, and I'm very thankful for being able to touch so many people with my music, with my songs. But I tell you, somehow I got that same feeling when I was a street performer down in the subways of Chicago. Yeah, that's right. I was a street performer. 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 And I, and I will always be first a street performer because that allowed me to develop my craft, develop my gift. And besides, it's a great echo down there as well. It was a great echo down there, except for the L coming by. But when the L would come by, I would try to challenge that L and sing louder than the L, and the L would roar. And I would try to sing louder and louder and louder and louder. But the L would be going by. I would get frustrated because I'm going to get my money if these people don't hear me singing, man. I wanted to tell the people, what made y'all put an L here? I love the sentiment and the thought process of R. He knew that something was working very hard to distract him. Whether it was his sister telling him not to be, you know, in the shower, whether it was the L, whether it was Andrea Kelly, whether it was Osriel Clary, whether it was a savage, whether it was whoever it was, Elisa Van Allen. Even at his earliest practices, distractions came before him working hard not to get the gift that God gave him that he brought to the world when he fell from the sky. But we still know his name, right? Regardless of all of the obstacles that he faced. Please share your thoughts there. What I'm trying to say. But then I come to realize that, hey. Sometimes you have to rise above the noise. Find a way to rise above the noise, Rob. And I tried to rise above the L. Still wouldn't work. So I became real slick. I would be singing like this. Someday the world would know my name. And I would be singing like this. Someday. The world would know my name. And here comes the L, and here comes the L, and here comes the L, and I'd shut up until the L stopped. And when the L stopped, it became quiet again. And I would say, I know someday the world would know robbers. Robert's name. And the people would clap. Oh, I said, that is. I got to wait till the L stop. That allowed me to develop my patience. Once I developed my patience, 
I come to find that I had learned how to sing with strength because before I learned how to develop my patience, I actually learned how to sing loud trying to sing over the air. Let's go back during the federal trial of 2021. Would you say that the L helped R. Kelly with his patience to get through the slander, the ridicule, and all that happened when he did when he did what he did, you know, to help others in giving of himself selflessly to those who would never have otherwise gotten that boost of self-esteem in being with a superstar on this level of romanticism. That had to take some patience that many of us would never have. What are your thoughts there? Now, mind you, you can pause this premiere and write it in the live chat box and you won't miss anything. You can click on it. You can pause it and then play it and it'll continue to move forward and you won't miss anything. So please leave that in the chat box. I would love to hear your views on that. Thank you. Which gave me strength in my voice, which gave me the ability to be able to ring out like a bell when I sing. It also allowed me to connect with people because I would be singing my songs that I wrote, but I didn't feel that was a connection. The only time I felt a connection is when I started noticing people were coming down from work to catch the L and they had McDonald's bags in their hands. And I was like, ah, McDonald's. If I write a McDonald's song while these people are holding McDonald's bags in their hands, I'm going to connect because they're going to laugh and they're going to say, I can't believe this guy's down here with a piano and a chitlin bucket singing a McDonald's song and I just came from McDonald's. They're going to feel like I'm talking directly to them and that's going to make the connection so that's what i did i went home i said mom i gotta write a, a mcdonald's song she said well you love mcdonald's you ought to be able to write a mcdonald's song that's your favorite restaurant i said that's what i'm gonna do so i went in the room and i started messing with my little keyboard casio that is and i said McDonald's is the place for you when your day is through. You can go to McDonald's and get yourself a Big Mac, a Big Mac. Order of fries, icy Coke with apple pie. No one does it like McDonald's. Do McDonald's and you. And the people would clap and they would go in their pockets. Oh, I got to pay this guy. This guy's too good. Oh, man, I got McDonald's in my hand, and he's singing McDonald's. Oh, no, he got to get paid. So people started pulling out 50s. I went from making maybe $10 a day, from being there from 9 to 5, to making four to $500 a day because I made the connection. McDonald's. His favorite place, it's a spiritual place, became the epiphany of slander. You know, it's like no matter what he tried to enjoy in life, something else was behind it trying to taint it. You know, I know he wasn't thinking about picking up young girls at McDonald's at eight years old when he was there, you know, with his mother, you know, what are your thoughts? Now that I know how to make the connection, took it to the next level. I hitchhiked all the way to LA, even on a motorcycle. Yeah, man, back to some guy's motorcycle. Um, 18 was a truck, um, broken down van, got me to L.A. where I lived on Venice Beach for like six months. I'm talking about the sand part. Yeah, I lived on the sand part of Venice Beach. There was a bleacher and there was a basketball court. 
and I would sleep under the beach bleacher. And I would wake up and I would play basketball with the guys that played basketball. Oh, and I would be killing them. They'd be like, where did this guy come from? <laughs> He's here every morning playing basketball with us. And uh, it was interesting because I would play basketball and then I would go and I would street perform with this guy that skates with the good top on Venice Beach. Yeah. And um, it was amazing times because those were the times when I was paying my dues. That's right, I was paying my dues. That's right, I was paying my dues, my dues. And sometimes you have to do that. You have to pay your dues. You cannot just wake up and be successful. That is awesome advice from the king of R&B. Now, R did that transition, being homeless, the transition of becoming R&B king. Did that homeless, meeting people of all types, but yet another obstacle to face and judgment was the obstacle. What's another obstacle that you can put out there? What's another obstacle? There's no real success without testimony. The depth of your testimony determines the height of your success. It's not where you are today. It's not how successful you are today. It's what did you do? Where did you go? What did you go through? Where have you been to, to get to this point? That's the engine. I learned a long time ago after performing on Venice Beach, after being a street performer in Chicago, I went to every talent show, you know, trying to um, win, but I lose all the time, especially in LA, because at this time, LA was a, um, you know, place of image. You had to look to par, not just sound good. And all I had was basketball gear. And I would do really good in the talent shows, but my image, I looked like a, a hooper uh, because I was at the time. So I'd lose. Um, but don't, don't feel for me because, see, losing is only uh, temporary. Losing, I looked at as a rehearsal. We all lose in rehearsal all the time, over and over and over and over again until we get it right. And that's the point of rehearsal. You rehearse and rehearse and rehearse and rehearse. You mess up, you mess up, you mess up, mess up until you get it right. But LA, street performing, the doors being closed, the nose and all of those things. Um, that was my meal ticket, somehow. And I decided then, I didn't want to be stars in the sky. Because though they amazed us as kids, you know, but they sat there. They just sat there. And they was fine. But what amazed me and what I've always wanted to study and always wanted to become, and I decided in my mind, and I told my mom, I said, Mom, I'm going to be a shooting star. She said, what you mean, boy? I say, I don't really know what I mean, but I know one thing. I love the shooting star. Why would you love a shooting star? You don't get to see it much. I said, I know. It comes, it goes. You're lucky if you even see one. I said, I know. And it's not like the other stars. I said, I know. But that's the point. If I'm going to be a star, I want to be a shooting star. I don't want to be seen all the time. That's not what I'm about. I'm not about just sitting around in the sky. I want to soar through the sky. 
in and out of space. People would tell me, well, you could do that, you know, sky's the limit. I say, no, it's not. I would always have my different sayings. I would say space is the limit. Because if you can make it to space, you can travel anywhere. That is awesome. He is so beautiful. I love you, R. So he, as a creative thinker, I know we've had some quotes that we've, you know, kept in our archive and never probably told anyone anything. Like my quote for the sky is the universe is infinite. Not the sky's the limit. The universe is infinite. You can do anything and everything that you put your mind to. So what are some of your quotes that you had about the sky? Because I know we all have one. So come on, share them in the comment box below. And my brain and my mind, I mean, you know, it, it just always wanted to go places no man has gone, so to speak. You know, I always wanted to be a scientist of music, not just music. I wanted to experiment with my music. I wanted to do um, R&B, but I also wanted to do the world's greatest, you know, but at the time... I was told, no, you stay in this lane, R&B artist, you're going to do the artist thing, you're an artist, R&B king, and this, that, and the other. I was never interested in being an R&B king. People put that label on me, and I appreciate anybody for saying that I'm the best at something. But I never wanted to be the best at one thing. I never wanted to be the best at R&B. I just wanted to be great at music. So I decided to do I Believe I Can Fly. I decided to go on and do... Um, the world's greatest. I decided to do country songs, pop songs. Uh, you know, you were not alone for Michael Jackson because I, I, I never wanted to be trapped in a category. And somebody said, oh, that's the R&B king. I wanted to be known for just music. That's Mr. Music. As he has no lane. The highway, the streets is his if he wanted it to be. But I came up in Chicago, and the minute I was born is the minute my father left my mother. Yes, the minute I was born is the minute my father left my mother. And I used to ask my mother, where is where is my father? And every time she shunned the question, she pushed me away. She said, never ask me that again. Son, never ask me that again. But it was hard because I would always see, you know, my brothers, you know, their father would come by every now and then and, you know, take them out, buy them things. And Christmas, Thanksgiving, Easter, you know, Halloween and I wasn't jealous of my brothers, but I would always, you know, become curious and frustrated because, you know, wanting a father, uh, not having a father, first of all, it's automatically something missing in your life. You know, there's no doubt about that. It's, it's you know, I always felt half. I always felt um, a hole in the situation. Though my mother was a mother, father, brother, sister, best friend and everything to me. Um, but she never was really a, uh, a father. My sister's father would come by every now and then, but I never understood why my father was not with you know, my mother. That was just a, something as a child I didn't understand. And it would hurt so damn bad. It would hurt so damn bad. And me being eight years old, I would be so damn sad. But as I got old, as I got old, I became closer to my mom. Me and my mom would go to McDonald's. 
before she go to work, before I go to school, and she would get us a Danish. That's all we could afford is a Danish and a cup of coffee. But, and we would split the Danish and cup of coffee. She wore this cheap lipstick. And she would uh, put three creams and six sugars in the coffee. And uh, she would stir it up. She would open the Danish, split it with a little plastic white knife. She had this cheap lipstick, and she would taste the coffee to make sure it was uh, sweet enough. And she'd leave the ring of lipstick on the coffee when she tasted the coffee. And I remember when she would give me mine, when I would sip from the cup, I would turn it around. And I would drink from her lipstick part. Because... In a son mother way, I had a serious, serious crush on my mom because she could sing her butt off. And uh, I just looked up and down to her. I looked around. I looked everything about my mother. You know, I loved her. And I even asked her to marry me one day. I was like, nah. She said no. But you know what? I understood. I understood. Uh, I took it well. And so when my mom passed, I was coming from my first concert from overseas, in which I wanted her to go with me because that was the only way I was going to get on the plane. <sighs> so when I got back from overseas, and my mom passed the day I got back, three weeks later. I went away. She was heavy set. She was my mom. I come back. She was very, 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 very. I had no idea she had cancer. I had no idea she was even sick. I went straight to Roseland Hospital on 111th in Chicago. And my sister and brother, I remember them to this day. She said, Mom's very sick. You might not want to go in there, Rob. Of course, you're thinking cold. You're thinking pneumonia. You're thinking she's going to be okay. So I go in the room. I peek my head in. I see the pastor with my mother. I see the doctors. And the first thing my mom said is, she screamed. Get out of Robert. I don't want you to see me like this. Get out of Robert. I don't want you to see me like this. All I can say is, I'm sorry, Mom. I'm so sorry. I didn't know what else to say. Didn't even look like my mother, but I knew it was my mother. And I walked up to her bed, sat, and I asked the doctor to pass the excuses. Even my brothers, them, they excused us. It was me and my mom. She said, please leave. I said, Mama, please don't make me leave. Something I got to tell you. I said, first of all, I love you and I thank you for everything you have done. Everything. Everything you've done for me, Mom. And I'm sorry for every time I've been bad or did something I wasn't supposed to do. And I promise you, and she died right there. Only I promise you. I called the doctor. They came in. They pronounced her dead. I was still holding her hand. But I finished my sentence. I said, I promise you, Mama, no matter what, by any means necessary. I will be the one of the best singers, songwriters. This world has ever seen. And that right there is the reason why we should call Robert Sylvester Kelly, R. Kelly, AKA US versus R. Kelly. We should call him the doctor. 
of R&B, Dr. Robert Sylvester Kelly. This is the time that we would like to share with you for giving us this opportunity to hear your story. Your enemies, your supporters, and your fans, we bless and thank you. I made my mom that promise, and um, I am still on a journey today to fulfill that promise in which I will perform and sing and write like one of the best who has ever done it. I owe it to my mom. I owe it to my gift. More than anything now, I owe it to my fans. Just to be one of the best. Not the best, but one of the best. Who has ever done it? It's going to be a little turbulence. But my teacher, mentor, pastor, and I like to call her my Mrs. Minyagi, my music teacher, Lena McLean, she said, do not write songs. Write life. Sex is life. So don't judge me. Don't be mad at me if I make a gospel album. That's life. Don't go getting hating and spreading rumors on me because I made a club banger. This is, you may be used to me spending and all that sweet whining and dining alone. Because I don't judge nobody when I go and see a good movie and somebody get their head blown off. I just enjoy the movie and I appreciate the movie. I appreciate the writing. I appreciate how they told the story. I appreciate, I don't get into, wow, oh, man, that, they got all these guns and they shooting kids and they shooting these people. So don't get mad at me if I write a song and say you remind me of my Jeep. It's just metaphors. It's just entertainment. It's the gift. No different than Bruce Lee. It's a gift. Bruce Lee was Ali. Ali was Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan was Superman. Superman was Spider-Man. Spider-Man was Batman. Batman was Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King was Moses. There's certain people, certain images that come to entertain us, to take us through history and all through genres and decades and years and years of struggle but inspiring us to be successful at the same time. That's all I want to be. Don't hit me. I'm an artist, people. And artists are going to go through depths. Chosen artists. I decided not to climb the mountain first. I decided to learn how to hold my balance. That's the struggle. Once I struggle and learn how to hold my balance, then I can start my climb. Because why? The mountain is a peak at the top. Where it's very windy. You can get blown off just like that. That's why I decided to hold my balance. Learn to hold my balance first. Because I don't want to stop my climb And get up there and the easiest thing Blow me off 
I want to be able to hold my balance and hold my balance strong. I want to be able to stand at the top of that mountain and say, I'm not coming down until I feel like it. I earned that right. Because I worked my ass off trying to hold my balance. Yeah, that's right. I'm proud of me. I don't have pride. I'm just proud of me. And I suggest, no, I urge you to do the same, to think the same, feel the same, be the same. Learn how to hold your balance before you start climbing that mountain because that's how one hit wonders happen. Everybody's so anxious to climb the mountain and knock other people down trying to get there. And when they get to the top, they start developing a pride and an ego. And out of nowhere, whatever happened to us, what's that guy name? He was out, he had that one song. He didn't learn how to hold his balance before he started his climb. That's why I'm still here. <clears throat> That's why I'm still in the game. Because to me, it is not a game. People say this, people say that. They talk about me behind my back. They talk about me in front of my face. They talk about me at the side. I can hear the whispers. I can see the gestures. I can feel the spirit of negativity all around me. People steal my watches. They steal my, 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 my cars. They steal my gold. They steal everything from me. They take my money. But I wouldn't change a thing. Because I'm not in it for money. I'm not in it for watches. I'm not in it for jewelry. I'm not in it for women. I'm not in it for cars and clothes and houses. And this is just something I was born to do. And I will be doing it until Jesus come back. I love music. I'm pregnant by it. I'm having aplets. That is an ultimate statement of greatness. See, and only a doctor who has been through the creative chaos and, and disassociation from the mundane physical life would ever be able to even connect that. You know, many people on a lower vibrational level will probably say, oh, R. Kelly has admitted that he's pregnant. <laughs> Not knowing that the metaphor is the process behind the words, the subliminals, the deep, uh, the deepness of what he's trying to get across to his people through his passion, you know, and I and I hope many people recognize that. Yeah. I'm going to love my babies. I'm going to raise them. I'm going to um, burp them. They're going to poop all those things. Out melodies. Born in the ghetto. Riding my bike, 14 years old. My mom says, you can go two blocks and come back. I said, okay, mama. Two blocks and back. Okay, mama. Two blocks and back. I promise two blocks and back. Then I get on my little huffy. Do like this, cause I used to do this. Because I used to want to think it was a motorcycle. And I say, brum, 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 brum. Brum, 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 brum. And I start paddling my bike. Thought I was the coolest guy in the world. I heard a gunshot. I looked to my right, I looked to my left, I looked behind me. I didn't know what happened. And out of nowhere, I started feeling woozy. Got really dizzy. I started feeling myself. And then I felt, and I did this, my hand was full of blood. And I looked. My arm was swollen up. 
so big, like a kneecap was on my arm right here. And I fell and hit the ground off my bike. And I remember opening my eyes just a little bit. And I saw all of these guys running towards me. And I said to myself, thank you, help. But actually, it was the guys that shot me. They were taking my bike. And I laid there. I could hear people screaming. I could hear people coming. Next thing you know, I remember waking up in the hospital. And I remember the doctor telling my mother that they couldn't move the bullet out of my arm. It's going to grow a tissue around it because it's too close to a nerve. And if they touch that nerve, it could paralyze my whole arm. Or the right side of my body. Oh! Don't y'all touch me. <laughs> I have a career. Yeah, I know I'm 14, 13, but I'm, I'm going to be somebody. And I can't do that being paralyzed. I said, Mama, please don't let them cut me, Mama. She said, don't worry about it, baby. They not going to touch you. It's going to be all right. You're going to be all right. At the time, I really loved basketball. I thought I'd never shoot the ball again. But I developed a shot. It was funny. Because of the bullet was in my arm, and every time I shoot a ball or lift my arm, I feel that bullet. That bullet, I decided, was going to be the constant reminder of the terrible luck I had coming up as a kid. Or it was going to be a wonderful reminder of how lucky and how blessed I am to be here today. And of course, I chose the second one. Are you kidding me? Look at me. Look what I've been through. Look. Look how many people I believe I can fly has been able to touch from here to Africa and everywhere around the world. Kids graduating to it. People feeling like they can walk out of the hospital and they feel better. They don't even have to know who wrote the song. It's people that love the song and don't even identify me with the song. I'm good with that. Because that song was not about me. That song was a seed planted in the earth for people to grow and blossom and go on and live their dreams like I've been blessed and able to do mine. Coming up in the hood, my mother and my stepfather fought like cats and dogs. I hated it. But somehow... The love she had for him, I, I chose to love him too. Well, my brothers now hold another story. My sister, they hated him. I found a way to love him because my mom loved him. Coming up in the hood, I don't even know how I got here. I don't. I don't even know. I don't know what these cameras are about. I don't. I don't know magazines and photo shoots and videos and award shows and Grammys and it's all still so surreal to me because my past is so strongly embedded in my head and it's. I don't know how I look past all of that and made it to where I am today, but I'm thankful that I did. I'm thankful because I want somebody else out there to say, wow, he did it. I can do it. All you have to do is believe. All you have to do is have faith. 
All you have to do is see what it is you want and become very stubborn and become very determined. Nobody, but nobody's going to tell you that success ain't mine. That basketball scholarship, that 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 trophy, that championship game, that ring, that football touchdown, that isn't mine. And now that I got the ball right, life passed me the ball. I got it. I caught it. I'm running. If I stop, I'm going to get tackled by a whole lot of people. So I stay running. I stay running. From now on, I'm going to be on the bright side of things. No more, I can't do it. It's my life. I'm going to live it. And maybe, maybe I'll succeed. What a wonderful thing to get up out this hood would be and maybe maybe times will change and someday the world they would know Robert's name Thank you for liking, commenting, sharing, subscribing to this podcast. And as always, keep it 100 and we'll see you next time.